All right. Um, you should notice that for the most part, the government, because of the First Amendment, protects the content of speeches, so protects the content of expression. So for the most part, government cannot limit the content of expression. Now, I want to be careful with my words because there are some speeches and expressions whose content can be limited and restricted. We talked about one yesterday with Schenck versus United States. If something presents a clear and present danger, then that can be limited and that's not protected by the First Amendment. But for the most part, the government cannot limit the content of a speech. However, and this is important because this is going to be on your quiz today and your test moving forward, the government can um, regulate and limit the time, place, and manner of a speech. Even though for the most part, the content of a speech cannot be limited and regulated by the government, the time, place, and manner in which that speech takes place in can be limited and regulated and controlled by the government according to past Supreme Court precedents. So again, time, place, manner, restrictions, and regulations for the most part are okay if they're done reasonably. Again, content of speech, for the most part, protected by the First Amendment, but the government can regulate the time when that speech takes place, where that speech takes place, and how that speech uh, takes place. So for example, we have many different city ordinances, for example, that says you cannot have loud music or protest at a certain time um, like, for example, in the city of McAllen, I'm pretty sure there's a city ordinance that says at 3 a.m. in the morning, you're not allowed to protest outside of a neighborhood. Now, they're not limiting the content of your speech, they're just regulating when you can make it. Does that make sense for everybody? Any questions about that? Let's talk about place restrictions. Can the government say, hey, you cannot protest at a busy intersection? Is that a violation of the First Amendment? No, it's not. They're, according to the Supreme Court, it is okay for the government to dictate where speech takes place. Because if you protest at a busy intersection, you're violating everybody else's freedoms. <coughs> and lastly, they can um, regulate the manner in which that speech takes place. Like, for example, the best example here would be noise levels. They can regulate the noise levels of somebody's speech. In the city of McAllen, can you just protest whenever you want? Usually they need your what? What do you need to get? A permit. And that permit dictates when you can do your protest, where you can do your protest. Again, they're not limiting the content of your speech. They're limiting where and when it can take place and how it can take place. Time, place, and manner regulations are okay if they're done reasonably. You don't violate the First Amendment. Any questions, guys? Let's talk about speech that are not protected. Or two, defamatory speech not protected by the First Amendment. These are sometimes illegal and they are limited by the government and the Supreme Court has allowed the government to limit and punish offenders. If you commit defamatory expression or speech, you will not be protected by the First Amendment. There are two types of defamatory speech, libel and slander. To, for something to be defamatory, it needs to be two things. Number one, it needs to be provably false. It needs to be a false accusation and that you need to be able to prove that it is a false accusation and they knew that it was false. So number one, a false accusation. That's defamatory speech. Number two, it needs to have injured someone. It needs to have injured someone. So false accusations. Wait, why hold this false accusation? Yes. Well, defamatory speech is false accusations that have injured somebody somehow. So we're not writing this on libel and slander? You're, you're writing it in defamatory speech. Libel and slander are examples of defamatory speech. So again, defamatory speech involves speech that is false and um, that has injured somebody. By injury, guys, I don't just mean physical injury. I mean financial injury, um, emotional, psychological injury. 
if I say Caesar kills babies, now that's obviously a false accusation. Caesar can prove that what I'm saying is false, but it would not be defamatory because I didn't cost him anything. I'm saying it in an educational setting. He knows that it's not to hurt him. However, if I go on his Twitter account and I post Caesar kills babies, he's trying to get hired at Burger King. The guy who's hiring him looks at his Twitter account just to check, just to do a background check, and sees that Caesar doesn't get hired because of my speech. Did I cause him something? Yes. I cost him a job. I cost him money. Now that's defamatory speech. So this usually pertains for teenagers like you guys for cyberbullying, for example. That could be considered defamatory speech. If you cause somebody emotional, psychological distress because of false accusations, that's not protected by the First Amendment. You can't tell the judge, oh, I'm just expressing myself. That is not protected. Defamatory speech is not protected by the First all right, let's differentiate libel and slander. This is easy. Slander is SSS spoken. Libel is written. Slander is spoken. Libel is written. Again, defamatory speech not protected by the First Amendment. Next, hate speech. Hate speech is speech that is offensive against a certain population or a certain group. Racial slurs, for example. So hate speech is extremely offensive speech. Question. Protected or unprotected by the person? Not protected. If I go on the street and I call a black man the N-word, am I going to be protected by the person? And Hate speech is protected by the First Amendment. You could do that. You can go out the street right now and yell the N-word if you want to. Not in school because we can control speech in school. Hate speech is protected by the First Amendment. Racial slurs are said all the time and there's nothing that the government can do about it because it's protected by the First Amendment. Hate speech protected by the First Amendment. As long as it's protected, as long as it does not directly incite violence. If it directly incites violence, then the Schenck versus United States precedent kicks in. So as long as it doesn't incite violence. So I can say black people are scum. I will be protected by the First Amendment. That would be hate speech. But I can't say let's go kill those black people because that that uh, directly incites violence. Does that make sense? No one confused by that? All right, there's this family in Florida. They're part of a Baptist church called the Westboro Baptist Church. And their claim to fame is that during soldiers' funerals, they would go picket and protest soldiers' funerals, people that died in Afghanistan and Iraq. And celebrities like Michael Jackson, they protested, for example. And they would bring in hateful signs like, Thank God for dead soldiers, or God hates fags, for example. Very hateful, very vitriolic signs. And stupid people that don't know the Constitution and don't know um, their civil liberties and precedents would try to sue them for it, and they would win, and then they'll get money out of it. That's how this family earns their money. They offend people, these people who are offended sue them, they don't know that hate speech that they're doing right now is protected by the First Amendment according to the Supreme Court. Any questions? All right, next. Obscenity is um, overtly sexual expression. Overtly sexual expression. Overtly sexual expression. Obscenity is not protected by the First Amendment. Like there's laws about public nudity, for example. So that's not protected by the First Amendment. So on your exams, guys, and your quiz today, they're gonna give you scenarios, and then you're gonna have to identify, hey, is this obscenity? Is this hate speech? And then you're gonna have to know, is this speech protected? Can the government limit this? 
Make sure you know in your head which speech can be protected and which speech is not protected by the First Amendment. Any questions? All right, move on. Freedom of the press. There's only one thing you need to know when it comes to freedom of the press in the United States. There's one rule that the Supreme Court has stuck by when it comes to freedom of the press question or cases in the United States, and that is in the United States, there is no prior restraint. No prior restraint. Generally, no prior restraint. What does prior restraint mean? Prior means before. Restraint means to limit. If you don't know what prior restraint is, prior restraint is censorship. Government censorship of articles, publications, according to the Supreme Court in the United States because of the First Amendment's protection of freedom of the press. General rule is there is no prior restraint in the United States. Government cannot censor publications and articles before they come out. Now, like, for example, in countries like China, where the government takes a look at publications and articles and they, they censor parts that they don't want the public to know, and then they allow it to be released in the United States, they cannot censor publications. The First Amendment of the Constitution protects freedom of the press. That was challenged, that rule was challenged by Richard Nixon in one of our reported cases, New York Times versus the United States. In New York Times versus the United States, the preeminent newspaper of the United States, the New York Times, got a hold of leaked confidential government information in the form of the Pentagon Papers. The New York Times got a hold of leaked documents called the Pentagon Papers. In the Pentagon Papers, very confident, Confidential, sensitive government information was in the Pentagon Papers, including the fact that the United States lied about their involvement in Vietnam. That the U.S. President lied to Congress, lied to the American people about how much or were we involved, the military was involved in Vietnam leading up to the Vietnam War. So in those papers, it exposed government lies. And the, Pentagon and the New York Times was threatening to publish it. Richard Nixon, who was president at the time, decided to issue a restraining order. He did not want the Pentagon Papers to be published by the New York Times, so he decided he's going to suspend the publication. And he has authority to suspend the publication of the New York Times. What is he doing? Prior restraint which time and time again before New York Times versus the United States, the US Supreme Court has not allowed government to do. That's the general rule. Precedents have been established in the past. But Nixon is confident on this one. Because I told you, the default is freedom. The default is not allow government to limit people's actions unless there's a good reason. This time around, Nixon thought he has a good reason to go against the Supreme Court's rule of no prior restraint. What would that be? Very good. That the information found in the Pentagon Papers, is, if exposed, will threaten national security. It will threaten national security. That reasoning worked in which case? What we talked about yesterday. Shank versus United States. It worked there. Maybe it will work here. So he's hoping that the Supreme Court will decide in his case, just like where they decided in Shank versus United States in favor of the US government in that case. So in this case, there's two things in conflict. Free of the press. National security, the government's interest to preserve national security. The question is, did the U.S. government, in this case Richard Nixon, our president, did Nixon violate the First Amendment's protection of freedom of the press? Did Nixon violate freedom of the press by trying to issue prior restraint on the Pentagon Papers? Sorry. 
Here's what the Supreme Court said, and this is one of the most landmark cases when it comes to journalism in the United States. The Supreme Court said, yes, there was a violation. There was a violation. What Richard Nixon did was unconstitutional. If you're the government, this is what the Supreme Court said, if you're the government and you want to go up against cases against their rule of no prior restraint, you're going to have to climb a huge mountain to do so. There is a heavy presumption against prior restraint. 99.99% of the time, the Supreme Court will dismiss any attempts of prior restraint. They're saying that this rule is as solid as it could be. 99.99% of the time, government that tries to restrict or try to impose prior restraint, they will be denied from doing so. And in this case, according to the Supreme Court, Richard Nixon and the U.S. government did not provide sufficient evidence that would suggest that the Pentagon Papers will substantially affect national security. If you're going to say it's going to affect national security, you better provide a lot of evidence, substantial evidence that indicates that it will. Absent of that, short of that, you cannot beat this rule. There is a heavy presumption against prior restraint. What does that mean? They are already biased and the court will be biased against any attempt of government to, to impose censorship, to impose prior restraint. So there, remember this word, remember this phrase, there is a heavy presumption against prior restraint. The First Amendment, freedom of the press, protects journalists, protects publications here in the United States. If you want to go up against this rule, you better have a lot of evidence. And in this case, Richard Nixon fell short. He, did not, he was not able to provide substantial evidence to prove that the Pentagon Papers were actually a threat, a substantial, significant threat to, na to national security. So his reasoning was not good enough for the Supreme Court in this case to restrict a civil liberty. Any questions? This is, again, one of the most important cases when it comes to journalism in the United States. The First Amendment guarantees freedom of the press. The burden of proof is huge. If you want to go up against no prior restraint rule, the burden of proof is huge. It is substantial. So, what is the precedent you need to remember here? That there is a heavy presumption against prior restraint. There's a heavy presumption against prior restraint. The court, 99.99% of the time, will not allow government censorship. In this case, what was prioritized? National security or freedom of the press? Freedom of the press was prioritized by the Supreme Court. They prioritized freedom of the press. Any questions? Sir, can you repeat what the general rule for prior restraint is? The general rule is there's no prior restraint. What exactly is prior restraint? Censorship. Oh. Government censorship. Prior means before, restraint means to limit. So before a publication gets published. All right, guys. Let's review before I open up your exam. A lot of you got this question wrong on your homework assignment. It did not quite prescribe to my satisfaction that selective incorporation means. In Barron v. Baltimore, the Supreme Court decided that the protections of the Bill of Rights did not apply to state and local governments. They only limited the federal government. But then after the Civil War, the 14th Amendment and the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment was added to the Constitution. The Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment allowed the Supreme Court to apply the guarantees of freedom in the Bill of Rights to the state and local governments. It, it allowed them to apply it, and once it applies, it also, those limitations are applied to those state and local governments. 
But why is it called selective? Because the application of the guarantees of freedom in the Bill of Rights will be done in what way? In a case by case, one by one basis. Not everything in the Bill of Rights, not all protections in the Bill of Rights will be incorporated, will be applied to the state and local governments all at once. It will take a long time. It will be a slow, methodical process. There's still some provisions of the Bill of Rights that are still not applied to the state and local governments, including the Third Amendment, including the Seventh Amendment. Make sense so far? Anybody know what's the last amendment to be applied to the state and local government? The Second Amendment. The Second Amendment. McDonald's versus Chicago. The Second Amendment was applied to the state. That only happened in 2010. It's about 12 years ago. You guys were alive, right? Yeah, you guys were alive. Then. All right, so that's selective incorporation. Think of selective incorporation. The 14th Amendment's due process clause is like a sponge. It soaks up the freedoms and provisions of the Bill of Rights. And then drip by drip, one by one, these provisions will be applied to the state and local governments. Will that make them stronger and stronger or weaker and weaker? States will become weaker and weaker because of this. As more and more provisions are being applied to the states, that's another thing that they can't take away. That's another thing that they're not allowed to limit. Any questions? All right. These are the cases for lessons one and two. You need to know the basic things that happen. You don't need to know all the details, but you need to be able to explain, the, especially on your scores comparison questions. What kind of question the Supreme Court decided, which clauses of the Constitution are involved, and what is the decision? Guys, let's make it easy for you. In each one of these cases, there's a policy that's involved. There's a policy, a government policy, that is questioned uh, about limiting something, a freedom, limiting a certain freedom. In Engel versus Vitale, what's the policy in question? What's the government policy in question? School sponsored prayer. School sponsored prayer. Teacher led, not voluntary, non denominational school prayer was being imposed by New York. That was challenged by the parents uh, in, in New York public schools. I don't have any questions on that. Wisconsin versus Yoder, what's the policy being challenged? Pennsylvania wanted all children to be there until what? Until the age of 16. That's the policy. Who's challenging it? The Amish were challenging it. What's the reason for the challenge? They wanted to leave after 8th grade because they want to raise their kids according to their what? To their religious values and they feel like high school education is in contrast and conflicted with those religious values. Make sense? Thinker versus Des Moines, what's the policy being questioned? What's the policy? Who made the policy? The school made a policy that they can't wear those black armbands, that's why they got suspended, right? The Tinker siblings got suspended, that's the policy in question here. Why did the Thinker siblings think that there was a violation of the Constitution? Which violation? What did they violate? Nonverbal. Nonverbal speech, freedom of speech, right? <coughs> Schenck versus United States. There was a law called the Espionage Act that did not allow you to interfere with military recruitment. That's what Schenck was doing. He was passing out flyers that discouraged people from signing up to the military draft. In New York, we talked about that already. All right, let's talk about clauses. And go over to Vitaly, which clause? These two are about religion, guys. There's two clauses of freedom of religion. What's so Engel versus Vitaly? Establishment clause, very good. When there's a question of government promoting religion, that is the establishment clause. When there's a question of government restricting the ability of somebody to practice their religion, that would be the free exercise clause. So establishment, free exercise here. Take your verse Des Moines, simple. You don't speak. Shank versus United States. What's a clause of the Constitution? Free exercise and establishment it has to do with religion. What's Shank about? So it's also freedom of speech. New York Times versus the United States, freedom of the press. So, Engel versus Vitaly, what was the question? Are school-led, non-denominational, voluntary speech constitutional? 
Are they a violation of the establishment clause? Here, Wisconsin versus Yoder. Can, should Pennsylvania violate the First Amendment, freedom of religion, um, by mandating mandatory um, public schooling until the age of 16? Did they violate the Amish's free exercise of religion? Thinker versus Des Moines. Um, is symbolic speech, is student speech protected by the First Amendment? Check versus United States. Can the government restrict freedom of speech for the sake of uh, if it presents clear and present danger? Then you should know the decisions for each one. Oh, I'm sorry, it's not Pennsylvania. It was Wisconsin. Yeah, but I got confused because yeah. the Amish are usually in Pennsylvania, but there's some in Wisconsin. Anyone have any questions? All right, guys, you got 25 minutes. Go do your test quiz online. Good luck. Mario, Ivan. Yeah, you're on the bus. See how far you get, and then let me know. I'll, I'll talk to you guys before you leave. Just try your best. If you have notes, you may use them. Books for me. Oh, you're not your phone. Then you can take it up. Guys, remember your score is comparative.